Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, the final fringe session uh, of day one of Nikon 2021. The title of the session here this afternoon is uh, Lessons from Finland, the world's first integrated health and social care data system. Um, I am uh, I'm Dan West. I'm the Chief Digital Information Officer at the Department of Health, and I'm going to be um, chairing today's session. Uh, I just want to say before we start, thanks to our colleagues at Fujitsu for supporting the Nikon event generally, and in particular this session. I am absolutely delighted to be joined uh, by two people. Firstly, Yari Renko, who is the Chief Technology Officer from something called Apoti. And for those of you who don't know what Apoti is, um, Yari will talk about that a little bit more in his introduction. Uh, and also joined here by Matt Chase, who is the Chief Technology Officer for Fujitsu Healthcare in the UK. So some excellent speakers uh, this afternoon here. Uh, and an opportunity for you all to ask questions. So we have, uh, as per previous Fringe sessions today, we have the chat function running here. Um, do feel free to drop a question in chat. I'll keep an eye on it through the session. Uh, and I will either play you in as we're going through the materials here, um, or we'll leave ourselves a good slug of time at the end for people to ask questions. Um, you are able to raise hands and bring yourself uh, into the session uh, on audio and video if you want to uh, ask your question in person. The more interactive this is in the, uh, the tea time slot, uh, I think the more fun we're going to have together. Um, I'm just going to ask really quickly Yari and Matt to introduce themselves. Yari, do you want to kick us off? Um, you're still on mute, Yari. That's the old CTO trick, I'm like breaking the ice. Well, thanks Dan and Dan, thanks for having me. Uh, as I mentioned, I work as, I serve as the Chief Technology Officer of the Sabot Initiative. We're driving to, not more or less, but to uh, push the digital transformation in Finland that sort of completely overhauls around 30% of our national uh, public sector healthcare and social care in a various uh, devious digital ways that I'm I'm very glad to be introducing to you guys in just a minute. Brilliant. Thank you, Yari. We should also say, uh, for those that don't know, Finland is a couple of hours ahead of us. So we're well into Yari's evening. So we uh, we add our thanks again for him joining us. Matt, do you want to just do a quick introduction as well? Sure. It's always hard following Yari, but I'll do my best. Um, so yeah, uh, Matt Chase, I'm the, the, the CTO for uh, Healthcare for Jitsu in the UK. Uh, just a a, bit, a, bit, a quick bit of background. So prior to Fujitsu, I was CTO for Guy St. Thomas's, where I was working on the, the final business case and led the, the, the tech work stream for the Epic Migration Project. Sadly, I've had to leave that, but um, I've carried on the work from, from what I gained in the NHS, building up a healthcare practice of Fujitsu. And yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just really glad to, to be here. And I'm really keen to, to listen again to what Yari has to share with us about the wonderful things going on in Finland. Yeah, brilliant. I thank you, Matt. I think without uh, without a great deal more delay, best thing for us to do to get this uh, this session really kicked off is for us to hand over to Yari, who's going to share some materials with us, setting out his experience working on this Apoti deal, and uh, and what uh, what it was attempting to achieve. So, Yari, over to you. Thanks ever so much. Let me twiddle a little bit to get be with my screens here, so I'll be able to get a good flow for this. Uh, just checking, you should be seeing some some orange stuff, orange stuff. Yeah, we have orange stuff through case study of a potty. Sounds great. So just to get ourselves oriented, uh, Finland was mentioned and uh, we're a couple of hours ahead of you, but I, I promise to not nod off in the middle of this one. Um, Obviously, to get oriented, you need to understand a little bit about Finland. We were for the first ones in the world to, to kind of like introduce school meals for the general population. That was 1948. Another sort of immediate uh, important thing is that we have the dentist sonar network in the world. Uh, two to three million saunas in Finland. Mm -hmm. Estimates around one per household. Uh, we drink the most coffee in the world. 
uh, approximately half again uh, more than the, the next sort of coffee consumption in, in the world. And also we have most heavy metal plants per capita, uh, 53 heavy metal banks in Finland for each 100,000 inhabitants. So yay, number one. Uh, it's often been said that, that we have a pretty decent healthcare system, public healthcare system as well. For some reason, we seem to rate rather high in, in many different sort of metrics that are taken, taken from different angles. Uh, this is one which is, which is very sort of comprehensive. By Lancet, the, the global burden of disease. This is uh, the one where 2018, we, uh, we ranked number one in the quality and equality of healthcare. Uh, together with uh, Iceland, Norway, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and Australia, and uh, well, uh, in in many many aspects, we have a really good and functional publicly funded healthcare. Uh, however, it's it's not a a place to kind of like start laying on one laurels and and start relaxing. The sustainability of health expenditure in Finland looks. Pretty similar to what, what many other Western industrialized countries are, are going through. So we have a lot of work uh, to, to sort of keep sustainable, to be able to maintain the current model. Uh, the, the cost is rising. And if one were to dig deeper into this one, the, you know, the sort of the relative portion of the specialized healthcare is increasing very fast. And, and this is not a, a positive development. So in order to tackle that, uh, I could sort of run you through a couple of hundreds of, of different exercises, many of which would probably be very familiar to you. But just as an example, I pick a couple to sort of illustrate the thinking or the frame of mind that was kind of like, uh, the, there was a lot of, uh, lot of sort of, motivation to move forward with before the Apathy initiative that I'm, I'm sort of on my part responsible for was, was even sort of initiated. But for one reason or another, it wasn't sort of technologically possible. Uh, I guess every country has their own sort of diabetes mellitus slide of themselves. For us, the numbers go like this. Uh, there's around 5.5 million Finns. Uh, DN2 affects 500,000 of us. Uh, the direct healthcare cost of diabetes mellitus and its uh, comorbidities is around 3 billion euros a year. And around 70%, a little less than 70% of that one is sort of perfectly reasonably preventable complications that could be prevented to a large degree. So kind of like putting this out, the potential for annual cost savings is around 700 million euros annually. And then a second one of the, the sort of two viewpoints I want to introduce before diving into the uh, digital sphere is a question that we've been asking ourselves or the sort of opinion leaders in Finland in public healthcare have been asking themselves regularly, which is more effective to treat the individual or treat the population. And again, probably very familiar to you, for example, treating the hypertension in treating the individual. So if we, uh, going back a little bit, if we treat the individual, if we give them the best possible care, we decrease the R and R to the 135 slash 85 and get a 60% decrease of the risk, or if by the same focus, we'll be able to tackle three in treating the population, but gain only the 40% decrease of, of getting the blood pressure down to 154 slash 94. So which is better? Is it better to decrease risk for a single patient by 60% or to decrease the risk of three patients by 40%? Uh, and I'm not even sort of making a statement, which is which. Uh, my, my colleagues who are clinical doctors and, and, and leaders of public health in, in Finland might give you a statement. I'm just an engineer. I, I don't presume to have an opinion on this. 
Uh, but the thing is that if we even want to ask these questions, if we want to target the risk, uh, if we want to do interventions on a sort of large scale populations, we need to have an understanding on, on how to identify the people, how to identify the uh, unique individuals, how to contact them, how to, how to personalize their sort of mass treatment, mass intervention, so that in the end, it's actually something that is meaningful and relevant to the individual. And how we, are, we would be able to scale the, the said interventions. It's become clear to us that the traditional ways of providing care, kind of like uh, through doctor's visits, office visits, nurses visits, uh, the, our current model is not sustainable. In fact, if we take a really, really close look into how we're providing care today, the care gap of the number of individuals is such that, uh, and if we define care gap of people not receiving the, the sort of optimal level of care uh, as, as would be dictated by the national standards for, for good care, uh, is such that in order to fill fill the gap, we would need an increase of clinical personnel in tenfold. Not 10%, but, but tenfold, especially when we're talking about large population level interventions, uh, such as diabetes and, and blood pressure. So for us, uh, the strategic uh, direction has been clear for a long time. To maintain sustainability, we need to be able to leverage digital tools in order to sort of uh, leverage the prevention. But for a long time, even our best efforts in, in sort of providing uh, the best practice digital care have been hindered by a lot of legacy technology. And as we all know, healthcare uh, computer systems are hard. It's, it's a bit of a moving target with a lots of overlapping difficulties. Uh, so now just kind of like slowly moving to the background of the, of the actual digital intervention or APTI as we call it. It is a name of the project, by the way. Uh, there's a Finland, a sort of small country in the cold north, uh, actually much smaller than it looks like in the picture. It's that Mercator projection that messes with you. But it's pretty small population, like for example, compared to UK. Uh, well, around this sort of same scale as, as Ireland. One third of our population lives at, around the capital region, that yellow orange path, which is incidentally the path that has been now tackled by, by the Apathy project. And the, and the organization of the, of the organizing and treatment of care is, is distributed by municipalities. So here is the sort of number of individual uh, decision maker organizations in social care and general practice. Uh, when we move to the secondary and tertiary fields uh, of, of hospital care, then uh, this area is provided by a single entity, Helsinki University Hospital Authority, 24 hospitals within one organization. So a lot of organizations, a lot of interfaces, a lot of interconnectivity and a lot of variance in the way uh, care is delivered, planned, funded, and how the sort of uh, digital aspect of, of making all this happen is organized. So 1.7 million. And uh, the organization I'm working now is, is owned by these municipalities and the hospital district. Uh, before my current role, I was actually the chief information officer of the hospital district. And I was sort of partly responsible for getting the ball rolling for this project, so to speak. So there was a, a shared vision of, of needing, needing to integrate the existing ways of working the existing patient pathways and the existing digital tools that enable us to have a clear strategic direction in the, in the overall scheme of things. And, and in order to do that, there was a sort of 
uh, there was an alliance of those different municipalities and uh, hospital districts, uh, which was kind of like, uh, I should say, a little bit on the different scale than, than usually is usual in the in the Finnish public sector for this sort of uh, organization and cooperation. Our um, how should I say, public sector tradition usually sort of directs these, these sort of operations through legislation, which is a, a rather slow and cumbersome process, not very agile in, in any way, but also usually sort of uh, is good from the point of funding and, uh, and sort of the equality of the solutions in geographical scale. Apoti was a bit of a, a sidestep from that long tradition. Uh, our operation was, was built on a, a mutual strategic contracts, not uh, dictated by legislation. And so this, uh, this group of, of various organizations uh, embarked on this, on this mission of overhauling actually a significant part of the digital platforms and interfaces and centralizing and unifying those tools. We set out from the patient uh, data system or EMR, if, if we ask the Americans for the term, electronic medical record, but also uh, took in all the other systems that are immediately sort of combined and integrated into that one. Uh, auxiliary care systems, radiology, uh, laboratory systems, financial systems, national, uh, national level registries, and, and decided to sort of make sense of this net uh, or, or mess of a network all in one go. So what I mean by all in one go, we, we did a sort of procurement process that took uh, two and a half years to prepare for and, and sort of go through the procurement and ended up in this uh, deployment timeline. So late 2018 was a first go live uh, of a specialized care university hospital at the city of Vanta, uh, followed pretty quickly in a sort of six months time with the general practice and social care in the city of Vanta. Then we expanded some modalities once the dust had settled at the original go live site of, of the city of Wanta. <coughs> added some users and then took a little bit of time to really digest the learnings of, of those go lives. And then February 2020, we went live uh, with 10,000 users of the university hospital and its major campuses. So uh, if one would have been sort of had a perfect vision to the future, everyone knows what happens after the February 20. So then the whole COVID exercise really starts sort of picking up speed. And now from one point, point of view, uh, then we had a completely new way of working with digital tools to a significant portion of the healthcare professionals, which is, a, which is not always the easiest thing to do in the beginning. But at the same time, we were able to provide digital tools to really run the operational uh, practices of, of uh, tackling the COVID pandemic. And it seems that the balance sort of evened out very nicely. Uh, the, our customers or the clinical users seem to be very rather happy after, after a while, and especially sort of saying that the overall grip that they had on the operational excellence of the various functions was a big bonus in, in tackling all of this. So then we continued uh, later that year with the second 10,000 of, of clinical users at the Hughes Hospital. And then moving on to the major uh, city general practice go lives. So if we could skip the details here, we, we see a sort of uh, a, a 
significant time window for a go live of a single, single, uh, single system. But still, when you sort of start considering the fact that uh, all the different medical specialities are involved, uh, how they sort of interplay and combine into the general practice and social care, uh, one sort of tends to see between the lines that there are dozens of different go lives and practices, hundreds of clinical pathways, and a, a complete overhaul of the system. So this is where we are at now. Uh, the year is uh, 2021, and uh, next month we'll be adding on more users at the city of Helsinki with a little bit expanded modality. 2022, the go live period of going through with the Sapotti uh, first stage go live is complete. As foreshadowed in the, in the beginning, one of the significant core technologies that we are applying is the EPIC systems, EMR, but by all means is that the sort of complete picture of, of what we're doing. But this is one of the platform technologies that we are we have been leveraging in Finland. And uh, uh, we're at, about now, we are starting to have a pretty good understanding of, of what sort of a beast Epic is as a system and as a company. And it has its pluses and it has its minuses, but, but definitely I would say that we sort of, we are decades better than where we were when we started this journey if we compare it to the 2017 situation. Uh, Apotte as a sort of name is, is actually three things together. It is the project that was initially launched in 2013. That was the point where the strategic initiative really sort of coalesced into action. Uh, it's also a company, a operational entity uh, created to sort of uh, own the assets and, and, and run the sort of centralized project. But it's also the system that uh, Apotti incorporated, the company is providing to our customers who are the, at the same time, who are our owners. So also I've mentioned that, that I, I'm, I'm making the bold claim that we are the first information and ERP system in the world to combine social and healthcare. Maybe a couple of qualifiers are needed. Uh, we are the first to combine social and healthcare in a unified platform in a way that from the architecture point of view uh, relies on a single record. It is a single human being and, and uh, the different processes that involve the person, different life processes, healthcare, social care, uh, are sort of bound into the, uh, into the overall where the thinking is always sort of ruled by the point of view of the individual and in lar larger scale also the point of view of a family. And then this sort of uh, creates some, some benefits into the way where sort of holistic care and end-to-end -end patient pathway thinking is, is made possible. Uh, where before we when attempting to do these things, uh, we tackled the kind of like uh, a large number of discrete systems that really don't communicate fluently with each other. So now we are kind of like the, the system creates us technical ability to do that. Uh, but obviously the heavy lifting is always how the organizations are working together. Uh, some quick points about numbers. So you get a bit of an understanding on, on what took us so long if we've been thinking about this ever, ever since 2013. So this is what we, what we now have achieved. Uh, today, we have roughly 45,000 social and healthcare professionals uh, on the system. Uh, the, the complete total investment cost will be 412 billion. And uh, we involved in the definition and design stage and the evaluation stage, more than 5,000 social care and healthcare professionals. So this is not being planned by engineers. It was really a huge scale involvement of, of clinical doctors, nurses, social care workers, support staff, 
physiotherapists and, uh, and the various roles in, in healthcare. Um, my portal in the extreme right hand, uh, upper right hand corner is the patient portal through which we are kind of providing uh, patient and, and citizen directed processes from a single application. MISA is actually a word play on the uh, epic product my chart. MISA is a, a Finnish uh, female name. And, and this has become a sort of portal where you can go kind of like go, you can have your telehealth visits, you can have your lab te test results. You can, uh, if you, for example, have a, a child protective services uh, uh, events going on, this is where the sort of documentation and what's happening next can be reviewed. If you're going, if you are applying for sort of assisted living, this is where we kind of like centralize everything. So now out of the 1.7 million population base, uh, we have uh, a little bit over half a million active users. 141,000 of those are minors where an adult proxy is, is taking the sort of operational or legal responsibility of sort of managing the things. So these are younger than 13 years in Finland. Uh, the, the demand for visit, video visits has sort of increased, uh, not hugely, but uh, we have something like more than 10,000 video visits under our belt now through this uh, MISA platform. And uh, sort of almost 400,000 sort of uh, secure messaging messages there. So it's uh, uh, number wise, if you show these figures to, uh, for example, an American, they're thinking that, okay, that's a sort of a small rural community. But from a Finnish point of view, where our sort of total population is 5.5 million, uh, these numbers are huge. This is the sort of most active uh, public sector portal and, and electronic sort of uh, electronic way of, of sort of being active as a citizen that we have in the country. Uh, more than 125 different systems integrations were required to make this all work. So this is sort of what we built. And uh, if, if I sound like a, a proud a proud child preening over their sort of accomplishments, you are absolutely correct in that one. This was a bit of an undertaking. And uh, from a technology point of view, it was uh, far from trivial. But as we all know, uh, the sort of underlying technology is it's not the point, it's, it's not the it's not by any means the, the way to measure the success or, or, or sort of, or the challenges of any such transformation. The key is always in the, in the clinical processes, in the healthcare processes, in prevention. So I'm veering a little bit from to that point of view, maybe trying to adapt a, adopt a, a sort of clinical view into this. 2018, all of the stakeholder municipalities employed hundreds of IT systems that really didn't communicate with each other adequately. They didn't support the daily work of health and social care professionals. A post-it sticker was, was actually quite widely used in, in many sort of longitudinal uh, patient, path, patient pathways. However, there was a lot of computers. When I say that, that the systems didn't communicate with each other, it means that uh, the, the sort of transact net uh, pathways that sort of transited uh, IT traffic, uh, around 5 million uh, messages were relayed monthly. So that's our data. So it's not fair to say that, that the systems didn't talk with each other. They just didn't understand what they were telling each other. So uh, a lot of the data was out of context and, and sort of it was, it was quite difficult to get a meaningful overall view, for example, a patient medication, overall medication, what stage is, is someone on a sort of treatment pathway and which ones of the populations are the blood pressure patients that are exactly at the right point in the, in the sort of a curve that you want to reach out. And these are the things that we, we started sort of tackling, standardizing operational routines, to get better quality, 
get data that can be comparable on performance on really sort of down to earth operational level. Cutting down the adverse events, uh, getting the, we should use the term electronic services, but this means that the sort of self services uh, provided to citizens, for example, through MISA portal. And then creating the culture of using digital tools to, to sort of improve the quality of performance. Uh, whereas obviously this is a, a sort of fundamental characteristic of, of any top level hospital or healthcare unit in the world. But what we sort of brought in was sort of developing a, a more of a unified approach into the, into so that the quality of this constant quality work was more a sort of unified between orthopedics and uh, psychiatry or, or sort of substance abuse supported living. And also making it so that this quality metric work could be sort of usable across the different disciplines. Mm. Uh, here's a bit of a different view in, the, in what we're trying to achieve. Here you see a little bit larger number, 50,000 social care and healthcare professionals. That's the target. When we finish this, we're going to be at 50,000 users on the system. The cost of all this uh, is around five euros per month per citizen, or uh, five euros per month per taxpaying citizen. Um, I mentioned data for several times now. So what do we mean, mean by data? Because uh, millions of transactional messages and, and Finland, okay, at least 30 years of, of tradition of, of using electronic systems in healthcare. Free text, narrative. The, the key point in our transformation is the very aggressive shift to discrete data. And, and this, we all know that this is a sort of double-edged sword. It's, it's not something that is immediately uh, embraced by many clinical disciplines. Some, some actually sort of jump to it, but in, in many uh, individual sort of silos of, of healthcare, uh, discrete data might be frowned upon. And we are doing this as a sort of balancing act to try to drive the, the sort of uh, adoption of, of discrete data in a way that would sort of provide the immediate and significant benefit. And when we talk about benefit, what really sort of moves these uh, professionals is the benefit to the citizen or the patient. So when we are sort of leveraging this up to, to include workflow guidance, uh, so standardized order sets, uh, improved decision support automatics, forecasts of the patient flow or the patient's condition, different safety alerts, so we're always trying to drive for the, the immediate quality, the immediate patient safety improvement. And, and this has been sort of our edge. Uh, what I'm not stressing is, for example, administrative costs or, or sort of optimizing uh, employee performance or, or things like you, which you might sort of hear in the sort of American hospital uh, executive narrative. This has not been our sort of key point. We found out that, that uh, focusing on, on these exact things, it actually tends to help on the bottom line as well, because better quality, less mistakes, more sort of get it right the first go. And, and for us, for example, the, the significant drop in, in medication errors, which was really quite significant, has been sort of paying for itself in a, in a significant way. Here are the key pillars of our, of our sort of clinical transformation. Structured documentation in the sense of discrete data. Uh, guiding workflows. The workflows in the system tend to be more guiding, not a sort of just passive, passive entities to type things into, but really sort of prompting and, and pushing forward. Uh, utilization of knowledge, getting instead of looking at the rear view mirror, getting into predictive analytics, what's going to be happening next? Uh, sort of, if you do that, what is going to happen next? But if you were to do that, 
what would happen then. Electronic services in our parlance means the citizen facing interfaces, uh, the, the thing in their mobile phone that helps them to connect to the doctor or the social care whenever the time is right for them. And then harmonizing best practices and, and driving the value up uh, through that. Um, I, I think I'm going to skip to the very, very sort of detailed part of this one. You'll receive the slides uh, if, if you want to sort of look into them. And I have actually a sort of second deck uh, as a sort of detail that this one attached to this. And uh, But I'll just kind of like summarize that for us, the transformation was in the scale of the of Finland as a nation. It was one of the biggest that we've sort of been doing in the in, in the last 50 years as a public sector sort of digital transformation. Uh, we are still in the midst of the really sort of leveraging the benefits for the clinical transformation. The technology part was, uh, it's, it's done. The systems are stable, they're good. The response times are beautiful. No hackers yet and, and all of that. But the really heavy lifting is uh, how you are going to sort of run the really clinical transformation through exceptional leadership so that the benefits of increasing quality and maybe sometimes taking a little bit more trouble than before through the work with the digital and the data. That is then sort of uh, how, the, how the sort of uh, added stress of twiddling with the computers, which actually many doctors are not too keen on, how it's sort of paid back to them by improved patient safety, improved quality, improved results of, of care, and being able to find the patients that are the ones that benefit from intervention. So this is our balancing act and uh, moving forward as we speak now. Thanks ever so much for listening. I'll be very, very happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Brilliant, Yari. Thank you very much for that. A fascinating summary and step through of what you guys have been doing. Um, there have been some questions added in the chat window here. So thank you for members of the audience who've, who've raised questions already. Do feel free to keep doing that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick off this uh, sort of second act <laughs> in this session here today as we um, get the opportunity to ask questions with a question for, for Matt. And I'm gonna go back to a couple of points that Yari has, has made, the, the picture um, of the mountains <laughs> that you guys have managed to climb over so far in getting to where you are here today, including the big tall one for, for the big launch in Hoos. Um, you had a partner that was walking with you on that journey. Um, and it was that partner that helped to deliver the techie stuff that you, you alluded to being largely done now to deliver the application into the hands of users in context such that we can really start to drive adoption and clinical utilization to build better health and care services and, and optimize use of the application in that context. So I wanted to bring Matt in with a question for, for Fujitsu, um, given that you've been on that journey with, with colleagues in Apoti. Um, what, what's that involved? How did you get not just the data center aspects of that, but all of the bits in between to, to get the application into people's hands and uh, and given your experiences there and, and your knowledge of the, the point that we're at on our journey, what's your advice to us in, in Northern Ireland, Matt? Well, that's a fantastic question, Dan. And I'm hoping to draw my skills as a bassoonist, having to what bassoonists do is have to sit and wait very patiently to come in and just play the odd note. So hopefully my old skills haven't left me. I, if it's okay, I'll, I'll just um, um, share my screen if I can. I don't think it's not, oh, it's going to let me. There we go. Hang on a minute. This will just help me uh, hopefully answer everything you need, uh, Dan. So, so the, the art, let me, the, the, let me, let me answer that by, by kind of stating the obvious here. I think, I think, um, you know, Yari has alluded to it. Um, even though Epic is, is broad on scale and, you know, it's, and it does a lot of things, um, actually 90% of the work, and I've used the word trusts here because obviously I'm from, from England, so their groups of hospitals, um, but uh, it, it equally applies to uh, HSCNI and it does apply to, to POTI. There's 90% you know, of the work isn't actually EPIC. EPIC will come along and, and be fantastic at helping you deploy EPIC. Um, 
And, and what, what do I mean by that 90%? Um, well, half of that 90% isn't epic at all. I mean, by far the most amount of work is going to be in the implementation planning. So it's, 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 it's taking advantage of how epic drives, drives pathways and workflows. And, and, it, and to be fair, there's you know, one of the reasons why you chose epic is because from a condition experience perspective, the interface in hyperspace is a country mile ahead of the competitors, in my opinion. I could be challenged on that, but you know, having seen having seen some of the other interfaces and reminding myself of how you know UI design was done in the 90s, it does, does take me back to those days. Um, so you've got this fantastic experience in hyperspace, and you know what you know what uh, Fujitsu has done with with a potty, and what 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 other partners would do with Epic Partners is to concentrate on that experience around Citrix, so getting the getting the hyperspace experience out. Um, uh, and, and, and that's not trivial, but it's not hard work. The, I say the hardest work is going to be you guys um, uh, uh, understanding how you want to transform the way you deliver care. Um, but then the other half of the work is where partners like Fujitsu come in. Um, and I put, I put some kind of um, eye candy up there. I hope you don't mind. I am incorrigible. But there's, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's at least 120 other considerations that, that that you'd have received around these, what we call the co-travel. These, the, these are the, the, the clinical systems that live in and around Epic. And Ayari mentioned, I think it's a hundred, is it 105 um, systems that you integrated? And, and there are various degrees of, of work to be done. So the IT optimization bit in that bottom corner, that's the, I think that's the, that is for, 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 a, for a company like Fujitsu, it's the relatively easy parts. Getting the things, getting the applications like Heiko, Cantu, Rover, and MyChart. We understand those things. We can get a great experience. The, the other bit going alongside that is, so there are a significant number of applications you'll still need to use. So, so getting, it, getting, getting the single sign-on experience and Improvata is, you know, is still the market leader in that space. And we, you know, it's, it, I, one day perhaps we won't need to rely on them, but for now we do. So, so, so that can help. And then I think as well, the um the managing identity and access management so so having a really slick solution that allows a request for access to be made and then that's being authorized by a, the relevant officer and then then technology then making sure that that's not just done in epic but in surrounding applications i think that's you know if, if i could stress one of the areas to get right it's that there's nothing worse than having a fantastic experience but it takes you five to 10 weeks to get it because there's lots of manual procedures to get there. Um, so if you move around to the, the top left, I think, you know, you know care or to a certain extent live and dies by diagnostics. Um, and I haven't included pathology in there, I could do, but um, we'll maybe have that on a different discussion. But I think, you know, uh, you know from, a, from a, uh, a broad perspective, having, having diagnostic imaging, um, available at the fingertips. I'm not talking about necessarily reporting and pack systems because they, they are still separate, but, but for the vast majority of clinicians being able to see uh, the images from an archive and having that experience with full context when you click on a carousel and, and exactly where you expect to see it then pops up alongside and you close and you can then go move, on, move on in the workflow. I mean, that, that, is, that is quite difficult to achieve. And I think, you know, if I wanted to give some advice and guidance, choosing the right, the right technology, the right the, the right uh, 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 partner technology that integrates as a, uh, you know, as best as possible with Epic, you know, that I can't stress that enough. And this is almost the same when it comes to the clinical documents repository. So 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 I, when I started at Guys, I was surprised by a the amount of paper that still existed, but b the amount of digital versions of that paper that exists and how and the velocity that it increased and how how much clinicians rely on, on that on that corpus of, of knowledge uh, for 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 conducting care. So I think having that having that system that integrates in the same way as the imaging services do, for me that's absolutely crucial. Um, um, because so for me it, it care is difficult enough and having 
systems that aren't fully aligned and, and, and helping you on that journey is, is just just adds to, adds to the, the clinical frustration. So I think if you're going to if you're going to be investing significant amount of energy, time, and resource into into Epic itself, but then let's not forget those systems around it. Um, and then finally, I won't dwell on this now because I am feeling the march of time, Dan. So I think once we get all those things right, then looking at insights and analytics, and and Yari mentioned that at the end. Uh, that that's a that's kind of the once you've got the hard work done, the the, the product of that is then being able to look at the consistent data that you've got in your system of record because Epic is a system of record, and then enabling systems of insights around decision support and population health science. They flow naturally once you've got those core systems in place so look ho hopefully uh dan that's answered your question um i will then hand control seamlessly he said back to you there we are excellent thank you matt I, the, the notion of co-travel as those systems that will surround the epic application is is absolutely critical and uh, that job of of deploying all of the technologies that allow us to integrate effectively in that seamless way that you were describing there for, for caregivers uh, to be able to do their jobs effectively and efficiently uh, and all of the techie bits that allow us to deploy the application into somebody's hands in a way that's just dead easy and intuitive um, is absolutely critical and a big part of what we're thinking about um, in our program here at the moment. So I'm going to I'm going to play in some questions from uh, from colleagues in the audience here and maybe intersperse that in the time that we have with a couple of questions that I've got. Uh, from listening to Yari speak. So the first one is about, uh, I guess it's a question about ontologies. So Yari, you've deployed uh, the Epic application in, in a bunch of different settings, primary care, community care, social care, uh, and in uh, the kind of secondary acute care hospitals. Um, all of those different settings will, I guess, have had different ontologies in the way that they describe the work that they did, the illnesses that they treated, and the things that they did to patients. Uh, how did you find the process of um, trying to standardize the, the codification standards that were used in those different settings as you then deployed that single application and mapping what, what was there at the start of the process to, to what was going to be there at the end? Yeah, thanks, thanks Dan. I, I think that's a great question. So uh, obviously, maybe explaining this kind of like a, as, uh, as sort of briefly as I can, um, the, the key point in, in achieving a successful sort of a overall solution is not trying to sort of cram the on, on, uh, ontologies into the same structure. Uh, ICD-10 is ICD-10, SNOMED is a little bit wider, but it then has connections to the ICD-10. And for example, Finnish social care work has a sort of code sets of their own. So child protective services processes uh, are not something that could use, usefully be mapped, for example, to ICD-10. Uh, but what you need to look is is for the shared interfaces. What what needs to be shared? What needs to what is needed to create a common understanding throughout the pathway? And uh, for example, in, in Finland, we had the benefit of a doubt of having a, a every individual has a unique identifier. And, and this this has been a sort of a administrative tradition for quite some time now. I think almost 100 years. So a lot of the administrative processes that we have already sort of are sort of clustered around this basic idea. And the next thing we did quite early on before kind of like starting with the process of, of even procurement was doing the analysis, where are the functional overlaps between specialized healthcare, uh, general practice, and, and what we call as, as social care. And I just mentioned briefly here that, that what each country means when they talk about social care has a sort of lot of variance. So, for example, to, if you speak to the Americans, they think that social care is something where you give money to lazy people or some other sort of stereotypical thing. Whereas in Finland, we, we see that part of sort of uh, supplying uh, sufficient need for, needs for those that have less money for one reason or another so that they will be sort of tidied over and become sort of uh, productive citizens again. But in, in Finland, for example, social care uh, com, sort of includes a wide variety of services, like from example, services for the handicapped, services for um, uh, assisted care, elderly, uh, rehabilitation services, uh, substance abuse services, uh, child protective services. It's, it's a long list. 
So where those processes overlap each other and where do you need to have a sort of flow of information through one to, to another? And then the next thing was that we, we identified the combinations and uh, during that process, we realized that a lot more than we expected, the processes were overlapping. We initially thought that these are kind of like, there is some overlap, but not, not so much. But when we really needed to dig down, dig deep into it when preparing for the procurement, so what sort of a system are we buying? The, the Venn diagram sort of tended to squish together. And that's where we sort of created new ontologies. Uh, at the same time, there was an ongoing national project where we created a sort of national level expansion of the code sets uh, that are legally required to provide uh, social care. So we have already had the national registry for healthcare for this sort of uh, shortened patient histories and prescription database. So we're going to go actually uh, 2022, we're going to go live with a centralized sort of uh, citizen history for social care in Finland. And Apathy has been sort of an active part in actually developing those code sets and, and that autography. So uh, to sort of summarize, there's a lot of work. It needs to be done. Do that before you buy anything. Standardization before you before you embark on a on a program, I think is is really key. We haven't finished that journey. I think there are some pockets of excellence in Northern Ireland. For instance, the the um, pathology project that we have to put in a new um, pathology information management system uh, that that was part of a program where we standardized order sets so that when one hospital was putting in an order, it was the same as every hospital and the, the laboratory facilities were fulfilling the orders in a consistent and standardized way. And then they went and bought a pathology information management system to sit alongside um, the EPIC application. Uh, there, are, there are some other areas where we've been thinking about implementation of SNOMED in primary care for a while, but we, we aren't quite out the gates with that yet. So I think it's a, it's a good lesson, Yari, to, to do that early. <laughs> Um, I'm going to I'm going to combine two questions now. One that, um, that Charlotte Pollock had raised about um, cultural change, and something that I was interested in, Yari, in your presentation uh, about a phrase you used: harmonised practices. So you you said you had about five thousand healthcare professionals, health and social care professionals, included in the the design and configuration phase, mm -hmm. um, and that that kind of that that plus the harmonised practices phrase makes me think that you set out trying to have, you know, a once for a potty approach to delivery of clinical pathways and services, uh, where the design exercise arrived at a consensus about how all healthcare professionals were going to deliver a particular service or discipline, um, and. And that's what we're doing, right? We want to create once for Northern Ireland rather than having five different instances across our five different trusts. But it's it's culturally hard in the design phase and it's culturally hard in the business change implementation and optimization phase. So talk us through what the goals were there, how you tackled it uh, and what cultural change was important across all of the organizations to deliver the right outcome. That that too is an excellent question. It's is a large question, as it is sure a good question. You, you are well aware. The, the main point I would, if I would were in a position to give anyone advice is that that uh, you have to, from the, from the word go, you have to understand that it's not a black and white process. So if, if one were to, for example, even combine two university hospitals and then really try to achieve full harmonization, uh, that, is a, that is not worthwhile as a sort of endeavor it would create more problems that it, it would sort of solve. So the secret there is that, that you, you share the same vision. We are harmonizing for the benefit of the patient. We are harmonizing to be able to sort of work together across different disciplines or across different hospitals uh, providing the same discipline of care. And, and the clinicians that uh, are involved in, in the process of the design need to sort of understand and commit to that above anything else. And then you get the exceptions. This is something that we don't want to harmonize because of X, or this is not sort of reasonable to harmonize because of Y. And then the, the process needs to be kind of like a self-guiding entity in the sense that uh, it becomes too complex for any sort of 
top-level governing intelligence to manage that all. Uh, because there are so many clinical details. So you have to be able to, or from, or from our point of view, you have to be able to sort of uh, give out the power to make even large significant decisions down the ladder into the, into the specialist hands who are sort of uh, part of the decision makers. A couple of key things that I think helped us along the way. Uh, we, we started creating the network of, of of the sort of uh, clinical experts that would be up for this task and sort of educated in it, have the patient to work with the IT people who are naturally shunned by, uh, by clinicians around the world. And, and also the sort of commitment to sort of uh, affect the slow change that this sort of, this requires. And, and we started building that network in the, actually in the university hospital years before the, this, would be called the later apotti even took place by creating this sort of IT specialists and, and actually we sort of intertwined it into the medical speciality uh, training that you can sort of apply in Finland, the, the IT, IT speciality. And we did a lot of groundwork in the uh, creating the cultural change that these sort of really, really big slow decisions on how to provide care we need to involve the clinicians there. We need to involve the nurses. And later on, we understood that this same thing needs to be done also in social care, but we were a couple of years later than that. So how do you sort of achieve that, that process? It's a lot of legwork. It's a lot of strategy level talk, but also for me, it took actually to take a large chunk of IT budget and to start sort of getting uh, respected clinicians kind of like, yeah, hey, can you, can you work for IT? a two days a month, maybe day in a week, maybe two days a week. And then they shifted between the clinic duties and the IT and started affecting change and created sort of trust in their colleagues that their word is heard and the changes that they push through are actually sort of implemented. And on top of that, we sort of scaled up and went on with the other. So it took years. And uh, kind of like in retrospect, we could have sort of done that even more because when the when the reality is, is far from optimal, when it's far from perfect, the trust in the, did my colleague do the right thing? Did they negotiate the right thing? That's the first thing that starts fraying. And then you spend a lot of time of kind of like convincing everyone that, okay, this actually is the is the right sort of deal to do when you're kind of, like, for example, tack tackling the uh, the detail level of information or the or the clinical fluency of the process, a lot of detail there. You have to trust your people, and you have to build that trust. In our case, years beforehand. Yeah, I think the key thing that you've you've well, you, you covered a lot of ground there. But one of the key things, given the stage we're at, is um, building that decision making apparatus, so that you have a group of people in the room doing the design work for a particular pathway or workflow um, and the system generally feel comfortable that they are truly representative, truly warranted to represent the needs of, of clinical networks and, and professions in designing how the new application configuration will support that work in the future. Uh, because it, it would be terrible if in several years time where we are rolling out the the solution to the the final trust or trusts in this process if the those clinicians said we didn't feel represented in the discussion and decisions about how we were going to work using this application so that that is absolutely key and is something that we are pretty heavily focused on at the moment um i i could go on in this discussion for another few hours i i really could this is this is a brilliant opportunity to pick the brains of of somebody who's been at the helm of this and not just during implementation, but through its inception phase. Um, and I do hope, Yari, as we've discussed in the lead up to today, that we'll get the opportunity to, to do this some more. Um, we are very nearly out of time. Um, what I will uh, do is, is, is give a, a huge vote of thanks on behalf of Northern Ireland to both Yari and Matt. Uh, and um, I will maybe just offer the opportunity for you gentlemen to make a, a couple of closing remarks before we... Um, before we bring this session to a, to a close. Matt, why don't you start and we'll leave the, we'll leave the final closing remarks to Yari. 
I'll keep it brief, um, so Dan, because this is I was honestly been I, like yourself. I could listen to, to Yari for for hours and hours and hours and and continue to learn. Um, I just I just wanted wanted, wanted to, to 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 you know to to am, empathise the fact that you've you know choosing Epic as the as the core for your transformation and your integrated care pathways. I think is a it's a, it's a very brave but a, a, the, a, a great decision. Um, it's my belief that um, choosing something else. I think I think I could, there are re many reasons why, but I think the clinician experience and the way you can put the patient at the centre of of everything. I think you, you, it's very difficult to achieve with anything else. So, um, hats off to everyone. I'm kind of jealous that that I'm not not going to be able to. Well, you can you can come else. and help come and there help us, man. Well, that's that's fine. Not, uh, Doors always yeah. open. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Chloe Wolf, who's on the call here, who's the uh, Epic representative, will be slipping you the £20 note later <laughs> on this evening. <laughs> and as we bring this to a close, Yari, thanks so much for your time. Do you want to make any closing remarks to the, the audience here today? Okay, yeah, please. Uh, so about Epic, I, I like the technology. But uh, anything I sort of describe now is, is not sort of dependent on Epic. Even for us, it was sort of touch and go. Surner could have been chosen in the very final uh, final steps. And, and I don't think my slides would look that very much different. So it's, it's not a sort of technology driven thing. Although Epic is a is perfectly fine system. Um, and, and we're very happy with the sort of cooperation in, in sort of general idea. Uh, Maybe the closing remark here would be that we're all in this together. Uh, we Finland wouldn't have gotten where we are now if I wasn't sort of, me and my colleagues went uh, welcome sort of open arms to NHS, to Ireland, Northern Ireland, Australia, Japan. We did a lot of footwork also in, in, uh, in Denmark where they're already sort of in the throes of implementation and they have a lot of sort of heartache and trouble there. We, we've spent many a week there and sort of comparing notes and, and what, 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 what sort of minds not to step on that they stepped on. And we, we were able to sort of avoid some by their hand, help and maybe not some others, not so much. So creating a network of sharing really information across public sector hospitals and healthcare professionals has been vital to us. And, and we made a sort of strategic decision of, of trying to give back whenever possible for us in sort of our our experiences. I just want to point out people were interested in, in sort of other other projects and other, other things. Uh, uh, relying on media information about these go lives can be rather misleading. Reach out to Denmark, reach out to Norway if you're going to go with sort of Epic and you get this sort of more realistic, realistic narrative. Denmark is a two years ahead of Finland. Finland is where it is now, and Norway is chasing Finland with very good, good bit speed behind us. And I, I, I think that most of these organizations are glad to share some of their learnings. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Thank you, Yari. And, uh, and the benefit is Copenhagen, Helsinki, uh, and Oslo, uh, all three cities I have worked in, are excellent places to go and visit. So uh, maybe post-COVID we'll be able to come in and uh, hear more and enjoy beer together. Um, with that, I will uh, bring a close to today's proceedings. Thanks everybody for your attention. Thank you, Yari and Matt, again for your time. Uh, and I hope everybody is able to, to rejoin tomorrow for the second day of Nikon 2021 uh, and you continue to get benefit from it. So thanks everybody. Have a great evening. Thanks everybody. Bye now. Cheers. Bye bye.